It's Monday, September 28th. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom. We begin with the latest COVID-19 update from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Melvin Pennant has the details. As at Monday morning, Jamaica's COVID-19 death toll stands at 93. On Sunday, another four deaths related to the novel coronavirus were reported. According to the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the latest mortalities are a 73-year-old female from Trelawney, a 92-year-old male from Clarendon, a 57-year-old male from Kingston and St. Andrew, and a 95-year-old male from Kingston and St. Andrew. All of the deceased also suffered from comorbidities. 153 new COVID-19 positive cases were reported over the past 24 hours. The total case number is now 6,170. 35 recoveries were recorded on Sunday, pushing that total to 1,741. The active number of cases is 4,250. It also disclosed that there are 26 moderately ill and 10 critically ill patients. A total of 124 persons infected with the virus are currently in hospital, while 20 persons are quarantined in a government facility and 21,727 are quarantined at home. At this time, there are 481 imported cases and 334 cases of local transmission, while 771 are contacts of confirmed cases. 236 are associated with the St. Catherine Workplace Cluster and 4,348 cases are under investigation. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. The global death toll from the new coronavirus has now passed 1 million. The virus, which emerged less than a year ago, would go on to affect the globe. The pandemic has cut world sports, live entertainment and international travel to an almost halt as fans, audience and tourists are being urged to stay at home in order to curb the virus spread. The United States has the highest death toll with more than 200,000 fatalities, followed by Brazil, India, Mexico, and Britain. Jamaica's COVID-19 death toll stands at 93. Signatories of the World Health Organization's COVAX facility are working to increase the number of testing and contact tracing in order to confirm cases earlier and reduce fatalities. Speaking at Monday's WHO COVID-19 virtual update, WHO Director General Tedros Cabasius announced that an agreement was formed to make 100 million tests available to low- and middle-income countries. These tests provide reliable results in approximately 15 to 30 minutes, rather than hours or days at a lower price with less sophisticated equipment. This will enable the expansion of testing, particularly in hard-to-reach areas that do not have lab facilities or enough trained health workers to carry out PCR tests. This is a vital addition to their testing capacity and especially important in areas of high transmission. The COVAX facility is a pooled procurement mechanism for the new COVID-19 vaccines still being developed. It provides for equitable access to affordable COVID-19 vaccines. Executive Director of Global Fund and co-convener of the COVAX facility, Peter Sands, says the move is a significant step in the fight to reduce the spread of COVID-19. They're not a silver bullet, but hugely valuable as a complement to PCR tests, since although they're a bit less accurate, they're much faster, cheaper, and don't require a lab. The significance of today's announcement is the entire package. The partners have come together to secure volume for low and middle income countries, to provide funding and to provide technical support on the ground to expedite rollout and ensure the most effective usage. The Global Fund boss says his organization will be using some of its $50 million COVID-19 fund to purchase and distribute some of these rapid tests but he notes it will not be enough. Fully utilizing the volume guarantee for 120 million tests, and I'm sure you can do the maths, will require $600 million, which we don't yet have. And even 120 million tests over six months 
while a massive increase over what has been available so far represents a fraction of what is really required. If low and middle income countries were testing at the rate high income countries are testing right now, 120 million tests would be enough for less than two weeks. Moreover, with the emergence of these antigen RDTs, we are likely to see testing rates increase significantly in countries at every income level. While scientists are still racing to find a working vaccine, governments are getting forced into an uneasy balancing act. Virus controls slow the spread of the disease, but they hurt already reeling economies and businesses. Meantime, citizens are constantly being reminded that masks and social distancing in shops, cafes and public transport are now a part of life. Sunday, September 27 was observed as World Tourism Day under the theme Tourism and Rural Development. This week is being observed as Tourism Awareness Week. Among the activities will be a virtual expo, webinar and youth photography competition. Tourism is one of the world's largest industrial sectors driving job creation, economic growth and infrastructural development. In the last seven months, however, the COVID-19 pandemic and its containment measures have severely tested the resilience of a global tourism economy. As Jamaica rebrands its tourism image due to COVID-19, two major thrusts are the local market and the development of the tourism product in rural areas. Carl Francis has more in this report. Rural tourism can be defined as the country experience. It's not just farm-based tourism. It includes agricultural festivals, religion, mysticism, ecotourism, sport, medicinal herbs, heritage, and ethnic tourism. With the COVID-19 pandemic, community involvement in sustainable tourism development in rural communities is even more important. However, rural communities are challenged to take full advantage of the tourism industry due to lack of sufficient infrastructure to support year-round visitors. Jamaica's Ministry of Tourism is working with rural communities to strengthen their resilience, create jobs, and build economic opportunities. An example of this thrust is the annual Blue Mountain Coffee Festival, which offers tremendous benefits to coffee farmers and communities in the hills of rural St. Andrew. The Agri Linkages Exchange platform is also facilitating the purchase of local fresh agricultural produce from farmers for the hospitality industry. It has made the sector accessible to more Jamaicans while allowing more revenue to remain in rural and economically marginalized communities. Minister of Tourism Edmund Bartlett says a five-year tourism plan includes the establishment of a special community tourism unit to work with rural communities to develop new authentic experiences for persons visiting Jamaica. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Carol Francis. Minister of State in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn has been appointed an advocate for women's health. Among her first activities was a tour of the Victoria Jubilee Hospital. More in the support from Marlon Samuels. Established in 1887, the Victoria Jubilee is the largest referral maternity hospital in the English-speaking Caribbean. Newly appointed Minister of State in the Ministry of Health, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn met with the hospital staff recently. She also toured the historic facility, which delivers about 600 babies per month. The services offered by the hospital include pre- and postnatal care to prevent, among other things, maternal mortality. We have a teenage clinic, yes. which caters for teenagers from under age 16 and that's that's a, a special clinic which is a, a pilot project for the entire island as well where we have agencies like Sissoka involved um, there is counseling in terms of the social worker 
and the psychologist, which we may need more psychologists. As we know, you know, mental issues are major issues island-wide. And, you know, in obstetrics, uh, with the pregnant woman, this is also an area that needs additional focus and will need more staffing and personnel. There is also a neonatal unit, a unit that looks at fetal development month by month of babies in utero and a clinic offering cancer care. For patients who may have precancerous lesions, um, leading, so we have a colposcopy clinic that looks at the cervix, looks at the abnormal pap smear, so we encourage all Jamaican women, I have to take this opportunity, to encourage all women to have your pap smears done annually or every other year once it's, it's normal and should start at age 21 or three years after you have become sexually active. And in 2020, no woman should be diagnosed with cervical cancer if you are doing the right thing. The hospital, which is charged with delivering Jamaica's next generation, has staffing issues. There are quite a number of areas to work on, definitely, as we see. It's a work in progress, but it's a good work in progress, especially where um, the ward with the, the babies. Uh, I like what I see. It's very modern. Uh, um, it, you know, have some good equipment in there as far as even the, the incubators, but we are in need of more incubators. And so it's a work in progress. And so once I sit down with um, the minister, we can then um, decide where to go from here. The 248-bed hospital, which offers specialist care for women, bringing new life into the world has four ventilators. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Marlon Samuels. Delegates of the People's National Party will elect the next president of the People's National Party, PMP, on November 7. The announcement was made following Sunday's meeting of the PMP's National Executive Council at the Jamaica Conference Center. The incumbent president, Dr. Peter Phillips, has declared that he would demit office as soon as his successor is determined. Member of Parliament for St. Anne Southeastern, Lisa Hanna, and the Member of Parliament for St. Andrew South, Mark Golding, have both indicated their interest in rising to the mantle. Jamaican-born Kay Mirage is aiming to be elected mayor of Palm Bay in Florida in the United States of America. If elected, she will be the first woman, person of color, and Caribbean immigrants to be on that platform. Ms. Mirage is a registered Democrat and will go up against Republican opponent on November 3. Call up the, the, the candidates, see what they're about, and because at the end of the day, they are representing you. They have to know um, that you have concerns, share that. And I ask you to do that with me as well. Share your concerns so that when we get there and we're on the dais, we are working for you. I'm ready to work. I hope you are. Day and night, getting out the message, knock on doors, meeting people, meeting the voters. If you meet someone and they don't know who I am, just give them a vote number, just give them my information because I'm ready to share the vision of what I have um, for this city with them. The Democratic candidate was born in Kingston, Jamaica. She migrated to the United States in 1998. Time now for a look at the local foreign exchange market and other financial indicators. We go to the business report with Gabriel Thompson. In Friday's trading session, the JSE combined index advanced by 871 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 77 stocks, of which 35 advanced, 31 declined and 11 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 5 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, Access Financial Services, and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica, AMG Packaging and Paper Company, and Cargo Handlers Limited. 
Trading firm were Berger Paints Jamaica, Epley Limited 8.25%, and Everything Fresh Limited. Barita Investments Limited was the volume leader with 14.8 million units, followed by Pulse Investments Limited with 2.8 million units, and Sagicor Select Funds Limited Financial with 2.4 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The U.S. dollar on Friday, September 25, ended trading at $141.97. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $108.02. The pound sterling traded for $183.31. And the euro ended trading at $168.45. Oil prices fell on Monday as rising coronavirus cases spur concern about demand, with the main crude benchmarks on track for their first monthly falls since April. Brent crude futures fell 32 cents to $41.60 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures slid 36 cents to $39.89 a barrel. And that's it for this edition of the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. In regional news, the ruling Barbados Labour Party kicked off its by-election campaign for the St. George North seat on Sunday with their candidate outlining the vision of the constituency. We hear more in this report. Moore was selected to replace a member of Parliament, Glenn Clark, who officially demits office on September 30th. Addressing the political meeting at a flat rock playing field, Moore made it clear that she was ready to work on behalf of the people. We want to see a transformation of agriculture in St. George. And I'm not talking about seeing our people merely as hewers of wood and stone and the bearers of water. I am talking about moving from fork and hole to greenhouses, hydroponics and aquaculture. In St. George, we do not have a sea, but there's nothing stopping us from farming fish. And my vision is one where we would want to see more commercial offices as we drive down Lower State. We are proud that of the ones that we've seen sprung up. But we want to see more industrialization coming to St. George. I want us to start growing what we eat and also processing what we grow to the point of creating new cottage industries in St. George. St. George North must become a major supplier to the resuscitating of the tourism sector. We cannot be importing chutney and barbecue sauce and canned vegetables. In St. George, we want to be able to plant and process the things we eat. That's why I'm very interested in the feedlot program earmarked for layers and enunciated in the throne speech. More also hit back at her critics. I understand that serving as a backbencher will not require me to take off my trade union hat. I come from an organization with a legacy of leaders who have been instruments of positive change while surfing in the House of Assembly. We do not have a legacy of being a fly-by-night organization whose leadership sits per perched like a paling cock, keeping real noise to get attention, but doing little else. I stand on the shoulders of the real trade union veterans in Barbados whose words have influenced decisions and who do not seek to inspire anarchy and who have used the power of the people behind them to bring meaningful change to this country. So there are some who would want to tell you that I should resign from my office as General Secretary of the Barbados Workers Union. They say so, and they know why. Because it is the only way that any seat that I take under the objective of serving workers and people of Barbados will have meaning, is if I continue to serve. They know why, because if I resign from the Barbados Workers Union, my influence on decision making is cut. Meantime, Prime Minister Mia Motley is holding the date of the by-election close to her chest. Addressing the gathering, she too responded to critics over the party's choice to select a trade unionist to represent St. George North. Honestly, I, I really want to know. You mean to tell me that Grant Lee could have choose a union leader and running in the former Hugh Springer? 
But me and Motley, the woman can't choose another woman to run as a unionist. You mean to tell me that Grant Lee could have choose Frank Walker to run in St. Peter? But me and Motley, a woman can't choose the next woman to run as a unionist? You mean to tell me that Errol Barra could have choose the same Frank Walker after he was an independent and put it to run? But me and Motley, the woman can't choose the next woman to run. In the Bahamas, all occurrence has been granted for the country to begin exploratory oil drilling. More in this report. Environment Minister Ramal Ferreira has revealed that the Bahamas Petroleum Company has been given all environmental clearances for exploratory oil drilling, and that's expected to begin in 2021. All environmental clearances were issued, and the proposed exploratory well that was scheduled for this year has been moved to the first quarter of 2021. BPC was granted the license for exploratory drilling back in 2007. Environmentalists have spoken out on the issue, even starting an online campaign to stop the drilling. Environmentalists did meet with Ferreira earlier in his term and asked for no licenses to be issued for oil drilling. We did meet and we did say that there would be no new licenses issued. I mean, that was the crux of the meeting. But this isn't a new license. This is a continuation of an existing license. And we were advised by our attorneys, the Office of the Attorney General, that this arrangement had to be honored. The Scrap Iron Dealers Association in Trinidad and Tobago wants transparency in the bidding process for material at the now defunct Petrochin plants. The scrap metal at the plant is a potential gold mine, but the association fears unlicensed operators may be poised to swoop in. More from Vidya Ramphal. In 2018, Trinidad and Tobago exported about 216 million TT dollars in scrap metal. During that same year, a potential gold mine appeared for dealers when Petrotrin closed its doors. The abandoned hunks of metal at various plants are worth hundreds of millions of dollars in scrap metal. On Wednesday, the Scrap Iron Dealers Association President Alan Ferguson said they had indicated to the Ministry of Trade and Heritage Petroleum, that's the company which now controls the plant, that they were interested in purchasing the scrap metal. Heritage Petroleum later put out an ad inviting the public to bid on the sale of scrap metals. However, after the dealers went to the bidding process on Wednesday at Point Fortin, they found new players from outside their industry tabling bids. All these massive contractors, these big massive contractors, wasn't it? Person in the 1% was there. Persons from outside of Trinidad had a team of persons right there. Mr. Ferguson wants Heritage to ensure there is transparency in the bidding process with properly licensed operators. You cannot purchase material without a license. You must have a, a scrapyard license that we go to one set of things to get, to get. Mr. Ferguson says he wants the Prime Minister to intervene as he believes the future of the scrap iron industry is on the line. He said if the contracts go to local dealers, the industry could create 3,000 jobs for Trinidad and Tobago. Video Ramphal, TTT News. In sports, we bowl off with cricket. The fourth T20 match of the ongoing series between the West Indies and England will be played today. However, hosts England have taken an unassailable 3-0 lead in the five-match series. West Indies women who entered the series ranked sixth lost the opening two games by identical 47-run margins to their world number two rated English counterparts. Despite going down 20 runs on Saturday and ultimately surrendering the series, the West Indies skipper Stephanie Taylor says she is heartened by the improvements showed by her team. The Jamaica Olympic Association just wrapped up an advanced sport management course. The six-module course is offered on behalf of the International Olympic Committee under its Olympic Solidarity Program, which is designed for capacity building for global member states. The offering is a professional diploma course in advanced sport management. Also, it is designed to be a replacement for a substitute or substitute for the basic sports administration course for national federations. The course is designed for staff and volunteers of national federations and other bodies responsible for sport development in their country.
Participants are drawn from senior levels in management of their organization or those who have responsibility for managing projects in the organization. And that's the news on PBCJ. Thank you so much for watching PBCJ. Remember, we are the People's Station.